Hello and welcome to our eighth lecture, or lecture for module eight, I should say. This is actually more than the eighth lecture. Um, we are getting towards the end of the course, and the last little bit, last three modules, we're going to be covering the three branches of government. And today we're going to start with the what is the most powerful branch of government, or at least the most powerful branch is intended by the founders, and that is Congress. Now, we need to talk about Congress a little bit here. Um, not only is it the most powerful branch of government, but it is also the most democratic branch of government. Um, you probably already know this, hopefully you do, that Congress is divided into two chambers, um, the Senate, which is the upper chamber, and the House, which is the lower chamber. <coughs> the Senate is designed to be the more deliberative body, the more elite body, whereas the House is designed to be more the democratic, more the people's, the people's house. Um, this, this reason that Congress is divided into two chambers like this is just more evidence that the founders were concerned about, about centralized power. So in order for a bill to become law, it has to pass both chambers of Congress instead of just one, which is the case in most parliamentary systems. Again, this is because the founders were afraid of too much centralized power, so they divided Congress up into two chambers. Um, sort of a philosophical argument that people have about Congress is whether whether members of Congress should act as trustees or as delegates. And what does this mean? Well, a trustee is someone who votes their conscience, whereas a delegate is someone who votes their constituents. So what do I mean by that? So let's say you're a House member representing the five, the good people of the 14th Congressional District of Tennessee, which does not exist. Let's say a bill comes to the floor for a vote, which, and you think this bill is very important, that it is would be in the best interest of the country for it to be passed. However, your constituents back home are overwhelmingly opposed to it. Should you vote for it and do what you think is right, or should you vote what your constituents want? If you're a advocate of the trustee theory, you would say you should use your judgment and vote for what you think is best. If you're an advocate of the delegate theory, then you would say that you should put aside your own judgment and do as your constituents want. Uh, most people don't follow completely into one of these two camps, and there's really no right or wrong answer here. I mean, you can find examples in history where where um, the majority has been wrong, and also where a minority has been wrong. So there's certainly certainly no right or wrong answer to this. It's just something to, uh, to think about. All right, some differences between the House and the Senate. If you want to serve in the House of Representatives, you have to be at least 20 years, 25 years of age. If you want to serve in the Senate, you have to be at least 30 years of age. Your term in office differs, too. In the House, it is two years. In the Senate... Um, it is six years. Um, if your constituencies differ too, if you're a House member, your constituency is a district within your state, whereas if you're a senator, your constituency is the entire state. Um, both House members and senators are directly elected by the people now. This has not been the case for most of American history, though. Um, up until the 17th Amendment, I believe, state which was went into effect in for the 1914 elections, um, senators were appointed by state legislatures. Now they're directly elected. Um, senators have the more diverse constituencies. Um, House districts tend to be very homogenous, and by that I mean red or blue. Um, most congressional districts are drawn in a way to maximize one political party's um, seats. So, like, take Tennessee, for instance. You have nine congressional districts. Seven of them represent rural Tennessee. Two represent urban Tennessee. So the, two, the seven that represent rural Tennessee almost always are going to send Republicans to Congress. The two that represent urban Tennesseans are almost always going to send Democrats to Congress. And this is how they're drawn. So if you're representing a district that is deep red or deep blue, that is easier. If you represent an entire state, though, say your senator 
Senator Blackburn and you're representing the entire state of Tennessee, you theoretically have to represent both rural Tennesseans and urban Tennesseans. So that makes your constituency a bit more, bit more diverse. Um, every 10 years, we census is taken. What is the census? It's how we count the population of the United States. And the Constitution requires that a census be conducted every 10 years because the number of representatives in the House is determined by population of the state. So in order to do, find out what the population is, we have to actually count so that we can divvy up the House seats, house seats um, proportionately. Now, I should mention this. When the House of Representatives was originally established back in 1788, it only had 65 members. And for... 150 years plus, approximately 150 years as the population of the United States grew, so too did the number of House members. But in 1929, it was decided that 435 was enough. And so membership in the House of Representatives has been capped at 435 ever since. So... But the population of the United States since 1929 has more than doubled, which means that your average House member today is representing twice as many, more than twice as many people as they would have 80 years ago. And 90 years ago, I should say. And this has led some people to argue that maybe it's time to make Congress bigger. You want more direct representation in Congress? You want to make the system more democratic? Then give House members smaller constituencies. That would allow them to be more plugged in with the voters back home, more connected with their districts. So that's one, one argument that I've heard. Not saying it's right or wrong, but that is, that is an argument. All right, redistricting. Every 10 years, House of Representatives redraws their lines. And this is why the midterm elections in 2018 and the election of 2020 are going to be very significant because and crucial because the party, state legislatures are the institutions which draw congressional districts within states. So the state legislature in Tennessee draws Tennessee's congressional districts. And if the Republicans control state legislature in Tennessee, which they will, I'd be willing to bet, then they draw districts to benefit Republicans. Same is true of the Democrats. So the 2018 and 2020 elections are significant because if the Democrats say were to win control state legislatures, particularly in big states, they're going to draw the districts to benefit Democrats, which means that the Congress, the House of Representatives at least, is likely to become more Democratic. More Democrats are going to get elected. And I'm not picking on Democrats here because Republicans were very successful in the 2010 midterm elections, and they drew districts at that point to benefit Republicans. So both parties do this. And this is what's called gerrymandering, named after one of the founding fathers of this country, a guy named Elbridge Jerry, who there was a famous cartoon of him. He drew a congressional district in, in uh, Massachusetts that supposedly looked like a salamander. And somebody drew a cartoon of it, called it Jerry Salamander, and the term became gerrymandering. Um, this, the only real rules, and so today, most congressional districts are drawn to benefit either the Democrats or Republicans, depending on which party controls the state legislature in that state at the time the district was drawn. And, of course, this is undemocratic, and this is one of the reasons that out of 435 House, distri house districts, only less than 40 are actually competitive in any given race, because... Districts are just drawn to benefit one party or another, which is a problem probably for the for the United States. All right, powers of Congress. Um, Congress has powers of taxation and appropriation. This is one of their greatest powers. They have the power of the purse, as it's called. They have the power to enact taxes. Only the le only Congress can do that, and only Congress can authorize money to be spent. Um, they have the war powers, which is shared with the president, but Congress is the institution that has the legal authority to declare war. Last time Congress did this was 1941 in World War II, but they have the power. They also have the power of the purse here again. Any war action which happens has to be paid for by allocations by Congress. So Congress theoretically could refuse to pay for a war. 
Um, Congress has the power to regulate commerce. The Commerce Clause gives Congress the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. Um, this power since has been expanded by the Supreme Court. The uh, Senate, not the House, but the Senate, has the power to advise and consent the President on high-level executive branch appointees, uh, judges, and ambassadors. So if President appoints a member of his cabinet, appoints a Supreme Court justice, or appoints an ambassador, a majority of senators have to vote in favor of this. Um, Two-thirds vote in the Senate is also needed to ratify a treaty. Congress also has the power of impeachment. Um, President, the Congress can remove any federal officials or judges for, per the Constitution, quote, treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Any federal official up to and including the president can be impeached. Only two presidents in American history have ever been impeached. That would be Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton. And neither of these presidents were actually removed from office. So no president has ever been removed from office via impeachment. What does impeachment involve? If there's an allegation that a federal official has committed a crime, then the House of Representatives will investigate. And if they find enough evidence to warrant a trial, they will pass articles of impeachment. If a majority of House members vote for it, the articles of impeachment pass, and the president or other federal official is impeached. But that's only phase one. Phase two then starts in the Senate. And the Senate holds a trial, and the trial works pretty much like a normal trial in that there's a prosecutor, there's defense attorneys, each side can, can present evidence for, to support their case, each side can bring in witnesses to testify and question each other's witnesses. At the end of the proceedings, the Senate votes on whether or not to convict, and if two-thirds vote to convict, then the federal official is kicked out of office. No president has ever been kicked out of office this way, but some other federal officials have. And, of course, impeachment is rarely used, but it is the ultimate check. And this is one of the reasons that Congress is more powerful than the other two branches, because Congress has the power to remove other federal officials. The president and the Supreme Court can't do that. Congress also has the power to override a presidential veto. Um, the president can't override Congress if they refuse to do what he wants them to. Um, so, in Congress, pays everybody, or not, I shouldn't say pays, but allocates funding for everybody's paycheck, too, that's in the government. So, this is another example of Congress being the most powerful branch of government. Congress has the power of lawmaking. Congress has the authority to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper, proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. And over the years, this power has expanded as well. Congress is more powerful than the judicial branch as well because they can A, impeach judges, and B, Congress may ordain or establish courts at lower levels than the Supreme Court. And Congress is the one who draws judiciary districts. So theoretically, Congress could get rid of a judge by abolishing their, the federal judge by abolishing their judicial district. Also, Congress has the power of oversight. The idea of here, they keep the executive, judiciary, and bureaucracy in check. Now, of course, how aggressive they are in policing the president, for example, depends a lot on what party controls Congress and what party the president is. If they're the same party, then Congress is not going to be as aggressive towards them as, if, as they would if they are of different parties. All right, how is Congress organized? Well, very, very partisan. Um, senators vote with their party on average about 83% of the time. House members vote with their party about 90% of the time. So Democrat on any given vote, the vast majority of Democrats are on one side and the vast majority of Republicans are on the other side almost every time, if it's a substantial vote. If it's a procedural vote or a symbolic vote, maybe not. But if it's something that matters, then almost all the Republicans are on one side and almost all the Democrats are on the other side, with a few exceptions, but fewer and fewer. Um, since the 19th century, this has party has become the main tool for organizing Congress. And the majority party has complete control of the House. So if you're the currently, the House is controlled by the Democrats. Any Republican bills are not getting brought to the floor for a vote unless the Speaker agrees to do it, which typically they will not. Occasionally they will if they need 
um, the other party's votes to pass something. They'll do that as part of a deal. They'll say, all right, if you vote with us on this and help us pass this, we'll bring these bills to the floor for a vote. But typically, um, the minority party can do little other than be the face of the opposition. This is also true in the Senate, but a little less so. In the Senate, the um, minority party has a little bit more power in that they can filibuster. But we'll get to that in a little bit. All right, so the most powerful member of the House, the person who presides over the House of Representatives, is the Speaker. And the position of Speaker is established in the Constitution. The Constitution is pretty silent on what the Speaker does other than preside over the House of Representatives. Initially, the Speakership was a nonpartisan post, but during the Andrew Jackson administration, Henry Clay um, made it more of a partisan post, and since that time, it's never really gone back. Today, the Speaker invariably views themselves as the leader of their party, and they view their job as Speaker as not to represent the House of Representatives as a whole, but to enact their party's agenda into law. And currently, the Speaker of the House is Nancy Pelosi, who's in her second second term, is, or second um, stint, I should say, as Speaker. And I'm going to give you the last few Speakers of the House, too. There's Newt Gingrich, who was Speaker from 1995 to 1999. He was, the, he was the leader of the Republicans when they took control of Congress in the 94 midterm elections. And he is usually considered one of the most powerful Speakers in recent history. He was succeeded by this guy, Denny Hastert who is usually considered one of the weaker speakers. He also, you might recognize him, he later went to prison for child molestation. But it's another story. Um, well, I should amend that. He didn't technically go to prison for child molestation. He went to prison because he was paying off, illegally paying off one of his victims. But that's another story. He was succeeded by Nancy Pelosi in 2006, or 2007, I should say, after the Democrats won the 06 midterms, and she served until... 2010, when the Republicans took back the House, and this guy, John Boehner, became Speaker. He served for a few years and was replaced by this guy, Paul Ryan, who was also the Republican vice presidential candidate in 2012. And he served until the 2018 midterm elections when the Democrats regained control of the House, and Nancy Pelosi became Speaker again. Um, Gingrich and Pelosi are probably your two of the speakers I've gone through. Um, Nancy Pelosi and Newt Gingrich are probably your two most powerful. The others, varying. Hastert, not particularly. Um, Boehner and, and um, Paul Ryan, somewhat. All right, other party leaders. You have second in command of the speaker is the House Majority Leader. And their job is to assist the speaker in deciding what issues to consider. You also have whips. The majority party has nine whips. And if you're a whip, your job is to whip up supporter votes, enforce party discipline. So what does this mean? Let's say, I don't know, currently the Nancy Pelosi is the Speaker of the House. And a bill is coming to the floor, the floor for a vote that she and most of the Democrats want to see enacted. She hears, though, you're also a Democrat, and she hears that you are considering voting against this bill. Well, guess what? You can probably expect a visit from one of the whips. And what the whip is going to do is try to convince you to vote for this bill. They may use a carrot approach. They may use a stick approach. They may use both. They might say, hey, this bill, if, you'll vote, if we were to tack on an amendment allowing funding for a bridge back in your district that you've been asking for, would that be enough to get you to vote for it? Or the stick approach, they might say, hey, I see one of your bills is scheduled for a floor vote next week. Be a shame if that got taken off the agenda, wouldn't it? So that's what whips do. Um, occasionally, they may give you a pass if you're, say, a Democrat representing a swing district or a red district. You might say to the whip, look, if I vote for this bill, I'm probably going to lose re-election next time. And at which point the whip might say, okay, fair enough. We would rather keep you in Congress and keep your seat than sacrifice you for this bill. So you get a pass. Go ahead and vote against it. We have enough votes to pass it without you anyway. And this works. Both parties do this equally as much. Republicans, when they're in control of Congress, this is what they do as well. Um, the other leader is the House Minority Leader. Um, they don't really have much power. 
They're the face of the opposition. They speak for the minority party. But in terms of power, they don't have much. About the only times they can become powerful is if the majority party wants to pass a bill, but they can't get all their members to support it, so they're short of a majority. At that point, Speaker Pelosi might call up um, the House Minority Leader and say, hey, are there any Republicans that would be willing to vote for us on this bill? And there might be some Republicans that represent blue districts. It might be to their advantage to vote for it, vote with the Democrats. But typically, they're going to want a concession in order to do that. So in other words, the Minority Leader will get back to Speaker Pelosi and say, hey, yeah, well, I've got four Republicans that are willing to vote with you, but they want you to agree to bring their bill to the floor for a vote next week. And, of course, from there, they'll negotiate, and if they can come to some kind of an agreement, they will. All right, the other chamber of Congress is the Senate. The word Senate is derived from a Latin, from a Latin word for council of old men. And this might actually be the, <laughs> the inaccurate description of what the Senate is. It's been called the most exclusive club in the world. Um, as of 2013, there were 62 millionaires in the Senate. I was not able to find numbers for today, but I would imagine the number, I can almost promise you the number has not decreased. Um, in the Senate, the power is divided like this. The Senate elects a president pro tempore. Um, this is usually the senior member of the majority party, but they have little formal power. The president pro tempore, though, does have a superpower, and that is they're in the line of succession to become president. Um, I should have mentioned the speaker is also in the line of succession at number three. So president, vice president, speaker of the house, president pro tempore of the Senate. President pro tempore is number four. After that, number five would be the secretary of state. But that's another story. But beyond that, the president pro tempore doesn't really have much power. The real power is exercised by the Senate majority leader who currently, as of 2019, is Mitch McConnell, who is one of the most powerful, probably in recent history, most powerful Senate majority leaders. Fun fact, Tennessee is the only state to have had two Senate majority leaders. That would be Howard Baker and Bill Frist. All right, Senate is less formal and less bound by rules than the, than the House of Representatives. They do roll call votes there, the clerk goes down the list of names in alphabetical order, and they vote yay or nay. Um, most, committee, most work in Congress in either house is done in committees, though, or subcommittees. As of 2019, there are 20 standing and select Senate committees, 24 standing and select House committees. All bills start in committees. Well, a bill is proposed, it is put in the hopper, um, from the hopper, the majority leader or the speaker refers it to the appropriate committee. So if it's a bill, say, dealing with the military, it goes to the Armed Services Committee. And the committees there then consider the bills and they either vote them up and down or they, or I'm sorry, either they vote to recommend them for passage or they vote to table them. If they vote to table them, the bill is dead. If they recommend them for passage, they go to the floor of the House or the Senate for a vote. Those are standing committees, I should say. There are also special and select committees. These are committees formed to conduct special investigations. So right now, the uh, Russia investigation, there will be a select committee on that. There's also joint committees. These are committees in which you have members of both the House and the Senate serve. And last but not least, you have conference committees. Typically, a bit the if a bill passes both the House and the Senate, it has to go to a conference committee because typically there's slight differences between the House version and the Senate version because each side can amend the bill. Um, if there are any differences at all, even if it's one word of difference, the bill gets sent to a conference committee where House members and senators come together and iron out the differences and basically standardize it to a single bill, which is then sent back to the House and the Senate to be passed again. Usually that's an automatic thing. It's very rare that a bill emerges from a conference committee and then gets voted down or in the House or the Senate. Committee chairs, majority party selects the chairs. So all the committees are chaired by the majority party. Usually, though not always, the senior 
member of the majority party chairs the committee they are on. Although this is not always the case, sometimes loyalty is rewarded over seniority. Newt Gingrich, for instance, appointed um, more loyal Republicans over more senior Republicans. But typically, the, major the, um, the senior most member of the majority party on a committee is that committee's chair. And sometimes people have called this the uh, senility system. <laughs> Get it. Below committees, you have subcommittees. Um, as of 2019, there are 70 of these in the Senate and 104 in the House. So a subcommittee is just a committee within a committee. 113th Congress, I couldn't get good numbers for the 115th, which is the most recent one to adjourn. We are currently, as of 2019, in the 116th Congress. But I think this one is probably pretty representative. Um, 3,809 bills are introduced. Of these, only 223 passed, so about 6%. of bills proposed, there is only a 6% chance it becomes, or it, I should say, is passed by Congress. Even less that it becomes law because the president can still veto it. Once Congress passes a, or once a committee recommends a bill, it goes to the full floor for a vote, and usually it passes the chamber, that chamber. So if it emerges from a House committee, goes to the House floor for a vote, usually passes the House. This makes sense because most parties are, or most votes are party line votes. So majority party, so if all the, say, Democrats in the committee vote for it, pretty much all the Democrats on the, in the House as a whole are going to vote for it. So typically if it merges from a committee, it passes that chamber of Congress. There are also what are called advocacy caucuses. Examples of this would be like the Congressional Black Caucus, the Pro-Choice Caucus, and there's others too, Immigration Reform Caucus. There's about 300 of these registered, and they don't have any real formal power, but they can be influential because they can form voting blocks. So if you wanted to pass a bill dealing, say, with immigration, it would probably behoove you to reach out to the Immigration Reform Caucus and try to win over their support, because if you do, that's however many members serve on that. Um, power lies in the speaker, the floor leaders, the whips, the rules committee, and the chairs of standing committees. As I said, only about 5% of proposed bills end up becoming law. And I got a Schoolhouse Rock video, which is going to explain it to you in more detail. Um, the House member introduces a bill, the speaker refers it to committee, it's debated in the committee. About 15% of bills emerge from committees. They then go to the floor of the chamber for a vote. If they pass there, then the whole process starts all over again in the other chamber. If it makes it out of that chamber, then it goes to the president's desk, who can either sign it or veto it. In order to debate bills, a quorum is necessary. This is 218 members of the House. Why is 218 a quorum? Because that's a simple majority. Um, taxes and spending bills go to the committee of the whole. There's fewer restrictions on debate, quorum of 100. Should mention, too, that any bill dealing with taxation must begin in the House of Representatives. Any other bill, though, can begin in either the House or the Senate. Another thing, most bills cannot be debated on the floor without a special rule from the Rules Committee. So the Rules Committee essentially has to, if you have a bill, even after it gets out of committee, it goes to the floor for a vote. If you want it to be debated and ultimately voted on by the House of Representatives, you have to convince the Rules Committee to pass a special rule allowing this to happen. And if you're in the minority party, good luck with that because nine of the 13 members of the Rules Committee come from the majority party. So the Rules Committee is one of the most powerful committees in all the House of Representatives. Something else which can block a bill, and that is called a filibuster. So, how does this work? Senate allows for unlimited debate. If you want to limit debate to 30 hours, 60 senators have to vote to do it. If 60 senators vote to limit debate to 30 hours, this is called invoking cloture. And this means that the bill is debated for 30 hours, at which point it automatically goes to the floor of the Senate for a vote. If fewer than 60 senators vote to invoke cloture, then debate will go on forever and ever and ever and ever, which means you can effectively kill a bill simply by delaying it forever. 
Um, now, you might have seen the movie Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, where Jefferson Smith gives a, I think, a 20-hour filibuster. Filibuster is essentially talking a bill to death. If the leadership, if the Senate Majority Leader really wants you to, really wants to force your hand on this if you're filibustering, he or she can force you to actually debate for this whole time. So in other words, if you're filibustering, if the majority leader decides to wait you out, they can give you the floor and you must hold the floor, which means you have to talk nonstop forever, theoretically. This rarely happens now, although it does every once in a while. Typically now, just the threat of a filibuster is enough to for the majority leader to reschedule whatever you're filibustering. The record, though, for filibustering is goes to a guy named Strom Thurmond, South Carolina senator who was filibustering the Civil Rights Act of 1957. He took the floor of the Senate and spoke for 24 hours, 18 minutes straight. Of course, you might question, how do you go to the bathroom? I mean, that's probably the first question you have. Well, you can't, so hold it. Or... There's other things, but don't really want to talk about that. So, but like I said, this rarely happens now, but it still can. And this is made possible because, again, according to Senate, per Senate rules, um, the only way to limit debate on a bill is for 60 senators to invoke cloture. So, if 51 senators support a bill, then, but or actually, so 41 sometimes can beat 59 as a result of this. doesn't matter how, if 59 senators support it. If they can't limit debate on it, the minority can just delay, delay, delay for an ever and eventually stop it. So this is a filibuster. Nothing in the Constitution about a filibuster. This just comes from Senate rules. There are also other roadblocks that can happen, too. You can have a hold. Any senator can put a hold on a bill, and this will delay a vote on the bill for minimum of 24 hours. So put off voting on it for a day. You might think this isn't very powerful, but it can be. If it is a very controversial bill um, and the vote is expected to be close, you can put a hold on the bill and fire, contact your buddies and interest groups and say, hey, send out an email blast to all your members. Tell them to email Senator Senators Brown and Smith who are on the fence on this and tell them to vote against it. If Brown and if the Brown and Smith are the two decisive votes and they're kind of on the bubble and they get 25,000 emails and calls over a 24-hour period telling them to vote no, that might be enough to push them over into the no column and kill the bill. So reality is that holds, although they may not sound powerful, can be in a lot of in a lot of uh, cases. So, how does the bill become law? Schoolhouse Rock explained it for you, although they left a few things out. Didn't talk about filibusters, didn't talk about holds. But basically, someone has an idea. They find a sponsor for the bill, a sponsor for this idea. The sponsor types it up into a bill. Um, the It's dropped in the hopper. We'll say it starts in the House of Representatives. The Speaker of the House refers it to the appropriate committee. The committee considers it votes on whether or not to recommend it for passage or to table it if they vote to recommend it for passage. It goes to the floor of the House for a vote. And if it passes the House, it goes to the Senate where the, this whole process starts all over again. If it gets out of the Senate, if there are any differences between the House and the Senate version, they have to be reconciled at a conference committee. Once this happens, the newly reconciled bill is sent back to the House and the Senate where it's voted on each voted on again in each chamber. Once it does this, it lands on the president's desk. The president can either sign it or veto it, or pocket veto it. But that's another story. We'll get to that soon. If the president signs it, it becomes law. If the president vetoes it, it goes back to the House and the Senate, and they can revise and retry again, or they can attempt an override of the veto. If two-thirds, or three, yeah, two-thirds of, both House members and Senators vote to override the veto, then the bill becomes law over the President's veto. It's rare that vetoes get overridden, but they ha it happens periodically. So that's how a bill becomes law. So 
And that leaves out a few things. It has to survive two committees. It has to pass both chambers. It has to survive a potential veto from the president. It has to survive filibusters. It has to survive um, holds. It has to survive. Sometimes even members will, in committees, will tack on amendments to bills, what are called poison bills. These are things that are unpopular. They're tacked onto a bill to kill it. It has to survive those. So not really surprising that only roughly one out of 20 bills that gets proposed actually ends up becoming a law. All right, new statistics here. Who serves in Congress? This is specifically the 116th Congress, so the one that was sworn in in January of 2019. The average age of a member of this Congress is 49, and that's down actually about more than 10 years from the 115th Congress. I think the average age there was more like 60. So this Congress is significantly younger. Part of this has to do with millennials have gotten elected to Congress for the first time. Um, this Congress is the most diverse in American history. 102 women serve in the House and the Senate, making up about 23%, which is still way below 50%, which is what it would be if it's representative. But still, this is the highest number of women ever to serve in Congress, about 23%. Also about 51 African Americans, 36 Hispanics, and 20 Asian Pacific Islanders, which I believe all three of those are records, I believe. I'd have to double check, though. Uh, about 40% of members of Congress are lawyers, and about 60% of members of Congress are millionaires. So in some ways, it's becoming more representative of the population as a whole, but in other ways, not so much. I mean, I don't think 40% of Americans are lawyers, and I guarantee you over 60% of Americans are not millionaires. I wish I was, but I'm not. All right, everybody hates Congress. But you know a story? Life in Congress, as a member of Congress, is not easy. You have lots to do and little time to do it, so you have to pick and choose. Typically, if you want to make your mark in Congress, your best bet is to pick an issue that's important for you and advocate for it, because if you, because that's really all the time you have. You try to advocate for multiple issues, you're probably not going to get anywhere. Um, it's hours and hours of work, thousands of miles of travel. Your life, if you're a member of Congress, probably looks like this. Monday morning, you get to the Capitol, Capitol Dome, probably around 7 a.m. Um, you meet with your staffers, find out what the emails have said, check your calendar. Um, you spend the day meeting with constituents, meeting with lobbyists and interest groups, um, going to your committees, going to the floor if there's a vote. Sometimes Congress remains in session past midnight, sometimes at 2 or 3 a.m. Um, if it stays in there till 2 or 3 a.m., it, it goes into recess at 3 a.m., you go back to where you're staying, you come back bright and early, 7 a.m. the next morning. You do this five days a week. Friday afternoon, you jump on a plane and fly home to your district. In your district, you spend Saturday, all day Saturday, and all day Sunday going to county fairs, high school football games, ribbon cutting ceremonies, shaking hands, and kissing babies. Um, so wear a suit and tie seven days a week or similar, similar equivalent um, clothing if you're a woman. So it sound fun and easy to you? It's pretty rough, actually. Um, endless travel, endless meetings, lots of work. You don't really have any kind of a personal life. If you're a House member, you get paid $174,000 a year, which sounds like good money. And I mean, I, I would take that amount of money, but there's, it's not as good as it sounds for two reasons. One, you have to maintain two residences, which is expensive. One in the D.C. area and one back home in your district. And two, the D.C. area... Is, has one of the highest costs of living in the United States. So $174,000 in rural East Tennessee would buy you an extremely nice house. In Washington, D.C. area, $174,000 is a down payment on a nice house. So it's, it's not easy. Um, you get mail, you get email, has to be answered unless it's too hostile. Of course, you probably get a lot of crazy stuff, I'm sure. Um, as a member of Congress, you have a staffer whose job it is to, or probably maybe more than one, whose job it is to read through and respond to all the emails. Now, you, when you send an email to your member of Congress, they don't personally read it. And they don't personally respond. And this is not criticism of them. They can't. 
they probably get hundreds a day. So they have someone whose full-time job it is to do that. And that person, as they read them, they keep a tally of, who, of what's being said, and then they meet with the House member or senator each day and say, well, you got your emails today are saying this. You got 212 emails concerning House Bill 1573. Of these, 112 say to vote no on it, 100 say to vote yes on it. So even though they don't personally read it, what you send them does typically filter up to them. Um, as a member of Congress, you have a superpower, and that superpower is franking. You don't have to actually buy postage stamps. All you have to do is sign your name to where the stamp should go if you're a member of Congress and the Postal Service delivers it for free. Um, you also send out mailers to constituents highlighting your activities. Now, this is a little ethically questionable because when you send out a mailer to your constituents back home, is that you, the, Fed, the uh, federal government pays for this? Does this amount to campaigning or is it simply informing them? I mean, as a member of Congress, it's your job to inform your constituents back home what's going on. On the other hand, if you're sending out mailers highlighting the good things you're doing, it's probably also designed to help you win re-election too. So this is one thing which might give incumbents a little bit of an unfair advantage over challengers. Um, Congress is universally hated. Look, here's the congressional job approval rating. It's actually up a little now. Um, at about 21%, that's nothing at all to write home about, of course. As you can see, it's gotten it's gotten below 10% before and hovered down in the early low teens. So up a little, but still not good. If you go back to 2009-ish, it got close to 40%. But yeah, in that whole time. About, I think it immediately after the 9-11 attacks, approval rating of Congress got over 50%. I think that's about the only time in my lifetime that that's happened. Everybody hates Congress. It doesn't matter which party controls it. Everybody hates Congress. 75% um, of Americans on average disapprove of Congress, but most Americans approve of their own member of Congress. So while if you, you live in the Tennessee 3rd Congressional District, you might, you probably think Congress as an institution sucks, but you think Chuck Fleischman, who is the congressman representing that district, is doing a good job. And this is true throughout the country. Most Americans think their member of Congress is doing a great job. It's everybody else's member of Congress that's screwing everything up. Um, and it, so, although Congress, and this is reflected in the re-election rates, so typically over 90% of House members in any given election get re-elected. Senators, it's a little lower, but still pretty high, roughly 80%. Um, this is because there's no gerrymandering in the Senate. These re-election rates in the House are partially so high because of the Senate. So what was it Einstein said about, supposedly said about the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results? We keep sending the same people back to Congress over and over and over again, even though we hate Congress. Yeah, there was a big turnover in power in this past election, sure. I mean, this was a considered like a really good year for Democrats and the House, but still over 90% of incumbents got reelected. I mean, that's not like a real like a real shockwave would be if half of them lost re-election, but that's probably not gonna happen in the in the near future again because of gerrymandering and because of how partisan we've become. So and again, this is because most because one, gerrymandering, and two, most Americans approve of their own member of Congress even while they dislike Congress as a whole. Um, Congress can do good stuff, for sure. They can also pass pork barrel stuff. What is this? These are sometimes called earmarks. These are amendments that are tacked on to bills that provide special funding for projects in their own district. Things that couldn't pass Congress on their own, but can pass when tacked on to a bill. Um, members of Congress love to tack amendments on to the Defense Appropriations Bill. Because that's the money that goes to fund the troops. And you can't really vote against funding the troops, obviously. So if you have a project you want paid for, tack it onto that bill and it's almost guaranteed to pass. Um, some of the more comical examples of pork projects was Representative Howard Berman got $200,000 in federal money or taxpayer money for a tattoo removal program. Um, Maine Senator Susan Collins and Olympia Snow 
<coughs> Representative Thomas Allen got $188,000 for the Lobster Institute because, you know, lobsters have to learn too. Um, $273,000 was spent to combat goth culture. Um, the Sparta, North Carolina Teapot Museum got $500,000 in, in taxpayer money as well. Now, everybody hates pork and everybody, well, I shouldn't say everybody hates it. A couple things. Trent Lott, who was a senator from Mississippi, once said that that uh, pork expenditures was any federal money spent north of Memphis. <laughs> Get it? He represents Mississippi. So in other words, anything not spent in his state is pork. Money spent in his own state is money well spent. And, of course, everybody thinks that, right? Like, so you could argue, for instance, that things like ORNL is an uh, example of pork expenditures. Now, the examples I've shown you are pretty ridiculous. So, I mean, there are some things are more obvious than others. That said, the money that goes to programs like this is a tiny drop in the bucket when it comes to federal budget, way under 1%. So I'm not saying these things shouldn't be cut. They should, prob they should probably, but I'm saying you're not going to balance the budget with that. If it was easy, if it was that easy, I think we'd have already done it. Some closing thoughts. Think Congress is broken. Um, again, I'm recording this in 2019. Democrats control the House. Republicans control the Senate. I don't foresee much meaningful legislation getting out of Congress because that would require the Democrats and Republicans to agree on something, and I don't see that happening. Um, as I think I've said before, the current system rewards grandstanding, doesn't reward compromise. As I've, as I've said before, I think in the campaigns and elections section, since most congressional districts are either deep red or deep blue, um, if you're a Republican or Democrat, your chances of losing re-election to a member of the opposite party are extremely low, but your chances of losing a primary to someone in your own party who thinks you're not liberal enough or not conservative enough are higher, so the incentive is to be as liberal or conservative as you can be, depending on which party you're in. So I don't foresee much happening in the next year or so. Is Congress broken? Maybe. I mean, the founders set up a system in which it is difficult to get legislation passed. So that's a feature and not a bug of the system. Again, though, that said, I, they also didn't anticipate this level of uh, partisanship that we have, too. So I don't know if this is, I don't think this is exactly what they would have wanted. Um, life of a member of Congress, as I said, is not easy, but I don't want to sound like I'm telling you to feel sorry for them because I don't, I don't feel, don't feel sorry for them because if you're in Congress, it's because you chose to ran and that's because you chose to do it. So not saying they necessarily deserve sympathy. I'm just saying that they do work harder than it appears. All right. And that is all I have for you today. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you back here next time when we talk about the presidency. Have a good day.